I uh, stopped by at Ed Rothfeller's this morning and he said he was coming. And he was coming with Gertrude Tuxen, who just celebrated, what, two days ago? Her 90th. Wow, yesterday. Yeah. Was it yesterday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terrific. Because we, we are going to uh, light two candles. If Gertrude comes, even if she doesn't come, we'll sing happy birthday to her. And we are also, after Blake's uh, presentation, going to, with Jesse's accompaniment, sing happy birthday to our little Hamlet of Harmon. Because this year is kind of its birthday. So. In any event, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, another Friends of History program. Uh, again, a large thank you to our special neighbor and friend, Jesse Beller. Yay. What would the... Was that Mrs. Beller? <laughs> no. <laughs> that was really kind. What would the centennial of our little Hamlet of Harmon upon us this year? About six months ago, I thought, gee, we should have some kind of a program on the Hamlet, the development, and certainly this guy named Clifford Harmon. Uh, knew very little about him, uh, asked around if there was anyone in the metropolitan area that knew anything about Clifford Harmon, and uh, Susan Lane said, yes, there is, and his name is Blake Bell, and he's a stick of dynamite, and he's great, he's wonderful, but he is so busy that trying to get him, to get it, pin him down, get him up here is probably going to be a major uh, achievement. So uh, uh, Blake and I started emailing three or four months ago, and uh, he would be disappearing out to the West Coast to uh, work on his uh, legal matters, et cetera, being back and forth, and I wouldn't hear from him for about three weeks, and I figured, well, Blake is <coughs> not gonna come, but in any event, thanks, Blake. You've been absolutely great. He, he uh, posted uh, Don't stop yet. <laughs> in the meantime, having found Blake, uh, my wife Joanne and I went down to Pelham, now I refereed soccer games down at Pelham High School and New Rochelle and that whole lower area, and I've never really noticed that there are some Harmon streets down there and Clifford and uh, uh, things like that. And I got on the, I, I checked the um, uh, Hackstroms, and sure enough, there's a whole bunch of Harmon stuff in southern Westchester, unknown to me, of course. One day, went down to Pelham and stumbled across. Pelham Wood, and that just, Joanne also said, this is breathtaking, this is just <coughs> incredible neighborhood, and this is all Harmon, part of Harmon's development, I said, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so, lots of good stuff. In any event, Blake agreed to come tonight, we are just so thrilled that he's here, and um, now a little bit about Blake, just a little. Blake is a graduate of the University of Virginia and their School of Law. He's a senior counsel with Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett in New York City. He is presently town and village, how do you do that? Town and village historian uh, of Pelham. He's a board member of the Westchester County Historical Society. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Society of the National Shrine of the Bill of Rights at St. Paul's Church uh, National Historic Site. If you've never been down to that, you've got to go. He's a, um, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Pelham Preservation Society. Blake has also authored numerous history publications. Whenever I punched in on the internet, Clifford Harmon, I got, Blake Bell, Blake Bell, Blake Bell, Blake Bell, wrote this, wrote that, wrote this, wrote that. So he has authored numerous history publications and academic papers. He is the 2007 recipient of the Julia Moore Reinstein Award for Excellence in Promoting Local History, awarded by the Association of Public Historians of New York State. And Blake just mentioned uh, a few moments ago that he is going to be writing an article, he thinks, either in this winter or in the spring for the Westchester Historian, which is a quarterly uh, publication, uh, which is done by the Westchester County Historical Society. So with that brief introduction, I give you Blake. that there will be a lot of things here that will be a surprise to you. I know that no one's going to know the history of this area as well as you. 
So what I really want to do is focus tonight on a biography of sorts of Clifford B. Harmon. But in doing that, I want to mix it up a little bit, and I want to not just talk about the wonderful things that he did and what his life was all about, but also give you a sense of what kind of man he really was. Because quite frankly, he was fascinating. I am so stunned and shocked that no one's ever written a book about this stuff. Okay, and there is so much about him out there. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to try to walk you through a lot of things. They're going to be little vignettes, really, from his life. Because there's too much there for me to give you a complete biography of Clifford Harmon. But we're going to start early, and we're going to make it up to his development of Harmon, New City on the Hudson. And we're going to talk a little bit about quite a few other neighborhoods that he developed all over the United States. Not just here, not just in Westchester County, but also in Kentucky and also in Pennsylvania. And you're going to see that he did this sort of thing in many, many, many different places. So I'm going to start just by saying that in 1909, as he started to drift upward in a balloon from the St. Louis Centennial, much like the balloon on the left, the name of his balloon was the New York. And as he drifted ever higher and higher and higher and higher, I know this man must have thought of Icarus and the mythological figure of Icarus. Because no one had ever reached 15,997 feet in anything that looked like that. Really just a little rubber covered piece of fabric. Clifford Harmon did it in 1909. <clears throat> That just shows you a little bit about what he was like. The photograph on the right was published in about 1910, or actually in 1910. And Clifford Harmon started as a motorist, an automobilist, as they call it, when it was newfangled. When the gasoline-powered horseless carriage first came out, he was drawn to that. But having looked at his life and looked at him and tried to learn as much as I could about him, I start to see that he was as drawn to the crowds that watched him as he raced those. And the crowds that gathered, like you see there, as his balloons lifted off. And the crowds that later began to watch him when he started flying the newfangled air machines and the aeroplanes, as they called them at the time. So Clifford Harmon was a very complex man, and of course he became a very wealthy man, and he was very politically connected, and he became a very early celebrity. And tonight we'll get to see some photographs of Clifford Harmon with some of the most interesting celebrities of his time as well. Now you're going to see Clifford Harmon there on the right from a little booklet that was published in 1910-1911. And he really turned out to be one of the most intriguing figures of the early 20th century. He was born in Urbana, Illinois in 1866. He actually came to the New York City area in the 1890s with a brother and with a member of what would become his wife's family a little later. And they formed a company called Harmon, I'm sorry, Wood Harmon & Co. And this company appears to me, from advertising and from many, many references that I've seen, to have been a real estate brokerage firm, not a real estate development company. Seems to have been a real estate brokerage firm. And we know that by about 1904, there were, it had at least 25 offices scattered around the United States. And we also know, and I'm going to show you a quotation in a few moments, we also know that Clifford Harmon lived in Philadelphia until about 1904. He had come to New York in the 1890s, but it appears that he became responsible for the western operations of the firm known as Wood Harmon & Co. And he handled the western operations of that firm from Philadelphia at the time. Now, Clifford Harmon, who had suspended himself beneath that balloon, and that was only one of many times that he suspended himself beneath the balloon, he actually set records for flight duration. At one point, that record lasted for quite some time. He was in the air for over 48 hours. Quite an accomplishment in the very early 20th century. He established the record for height 
Take the altitude record of 15,997 feet, stood until about 1923. So that was also a substantial record, quite a feat. And he made quite a name for himself. But he ended up experiencing something that was fairly watershed <coughs> for him. You'll see that there are all these quotes that start to appear in the 1909-1910 time frame. One of those quotes that you see on the screen says, quote, Clifford B. Harmon has the double distinction of being not only the foremost amateur <coughs> aviator of America, but his feats have also at times excelled those of the professional airmen. Okay, that's from a book that was published in 1910. Now, that's Clifford Harmon on the right at the controls of one of his biplanes. How did he get to be an aviator? We know the answer to that, and it's a fascinating story. It turns out that Clifford Harmon decided to participate as a balloonist in a special meet, okay, the Los Angeles Aviation Meet. And there he met a fellow by the name of, and my French is non-existent, I'll do the best I can, Louis Paul, P-A-U-L-H-A-N. And Louis Paul was the foremost aviator of his day. Now, this is interesting. I want you to think carefully about this. This meet was in January of 1910. Louis Pavon, Pavon had already won thousands of British pounds worth of prizes as the foremost aviator who had learned to fly in July of 1909, six months earlier. <laughs> now, you got to think about this because Wilbur and Orville Wright had established manned flight, in effect, only a few years before that, December 17, 1903. So you're really still in the dawn of manned flight at this time. And Louis Paulon was at the Los Angeles Aviation Meet. And Clifford Harmon was there with his balloon in New York. Louis Paulon had a Farman, F-A-R-M-A-N, -E biplane. Louis Poulon burned up that meat, took most of the prizes, and Clifford Harmon was fascinated with what he saw. And according to one account, he approached Louis Poulon, he bought the biplane there, he bought it. Had it dismantled, had it shipped back east, but had Louis Poulon give him flying lessons out there had this shipped all the way back and began flying it in Mineola, Long Island, where he attracted crowds, very large crowds. And all he would do is practice flying ever higher. You read the accounts about Clifford Harmon flying in Mineola today, 40 feet off the ground. When he saw that the engine was doing fairly well, he decided to go as high as 100 feet off the ground. And the crowds gathered to watch this at the time. And now I'm going to get back to the man and maybe the psychological piece of what kind of motivated him. I think he loved the crowds. And I think he loved the attention as much as anything else. I think he loved being the daredevil motorist using the newfangled automobile. And when that didn't do it any longer for him, he became a balloonist. And then when he saw all the attention go into the young aviators, the dashing airmen, and the Birdmen, as they were called at the time, he had decided, well, I'm going to buy one of those biplanes, and I'm going to learn to fly it. And that's what he began doing. <clears throat> now, so far, this is all interesting, but what does it have to do with real estate development? Well, actually, you're going to see in a little bit that this showman quality, as far as I'm concerned, began to kind of make its way into almost everything he did when he was trying to develop new housing subdevelopments all over the country. So we're going to look at a few examples of those sorts of things. But I don't want to get too far away from his personal life. So let me go back and talk a little bit about what happened to him in about the 1904 time frame. He meets a woman. I hope I get this right. Her name was Louise uh, Benedict, I believe it was. Let me see if I get it right. Benedict, think about that. You know, Benedict Boulevard, Benedict, Pelham, Benedict, Boulevard. It's Benedict Avenue, Benedict Avenue in Pelham, and you're going to see that in and Croton, and Croton, and Croton, and Croton they, in many of these Harmon places, there are Harmon Avenues, Benedict Place, Benedict Avenue, you know, all kinds of names that begin to kind of see, you see throughout his developments. 
And then it gets even more interesting. Because you look to see where his sales office was. And funny thing, it was there at the corner of Benedict. And funny thing, it was on Benedict in this location. And it was on Benedict in this location, too. And you start to see, if not a sense of humor, if nothing else, some cookie cutter elements to this is how I'm going to do my developments as I try to develop these areas and try to make a little money from subdividing and selling lots. So I've got to go to my notes here for just a second. This is too much for me to remember. So it was 1905. I thought it was 1904. I'm sorry. 1905, he marries Louise Adele Benedict. Now, Louise Adele Benedict was the daughter of a very wealthy man, a very well-known man, Okay, he went by the name of Commodore Elias Cornelius Benedict, who had a massive estate in Greenwich. And I'm telling you that now because in a few moments we're going to talk a little bit about something that happened to Clifford Harmon when he was trying to get, think about what I'm about to say, from Long Island to Greenwich, across Long Island Sound, which at that time had never been done in an airplane. So Clifford Harmon had a lot of daredevilness, daredevil in him. And he married this woman in 1905, and as best we can tell, it wasn't the greatest of marriages. And in fact, he traveled the world, and he spent clearly as much time doing these sorts of things as any time he spent that you might consider quality family time. And ultimately, we're going to see, he went off to World War I, and he never returned home to his wife, ever. And in 1924, she was able, she filed for divorce. And uh, that divorce, in fact, was granted. And Clifford Harmon really never spent any additional time with her after he went away to war. So I'm going to try to move you through a couple of small parts of his life. Right here is a photograph of Louis Colomb. Okay, This is the man who was his teacher. This is the man who was his mentor. This is the man from whom he bought the farm and by play. This is the man with whom he became close friends and who taught him to fly. And it became his passion for the rest of his life. Flying to him was what it was all about. Now, we ask the question, wasn't he a real estate developer? What does all this have to do with real estate development? Well, the announcement of his engagement to Louise Benedict, Louise Adele Benedict, noted, as you see on the screen, quote, that his current report today that Miss Louise Benedict, the youngest daughter of Commodore and Mrs. Elias C. Benedict, has become engaged to Clifford B. Harmon, a wealthy Philadelphian. Mr. Harmon is a member of the firm of Wood, Harmon & Co. Real Estate Brokers of Broadway, New York, with 25 branches scattered throughout the country. He has charge principally of the western section of the United States. Now, Clifford Harmon, in the first decade of the 20th century, seems to have shifted his focus from real estate brokerage activities to real estate development activities. And though not the earliest, one of his early developments was Harmon, as he called it originally, Harmon, New City on the Hudson. And in effect, what he did was he acquired, as so many of you will know so far, so much better than I, a portion of the old Portland estate, and then subdivided that into lots and began to sell those lots to be built upon by others. Okay, began developing the lots and developing the area, but we're going to start to see some of the little tricks he began to use and some of the things that he was doing to attract buyers to this area, and then. If you look at other areas that were being developed at about the same time, 1906, 1907, in Pelham, 1909, 1910, he's using a lot of the same tricks. He's using a lot of the same media. He's using postcards, like the one you see there. In Pelham Wood, he was using mechanical postcards. You pop them open, and the postcard would pop up a little house, like ones in the developments. He was using all kinds of little tricks to try to attract buyers. And why was that? Because there was a massive effort to develop all around New York City at the time, and he was competing 
for buyers at the time. Some examples of his early developments. Okay, Harmon, we know that. Pelham Wood, you've heard me talk about that. Larchmont Gardens in Larchmont, New York. Woods Acres, which was a Lower Westchester development. East Lansdowne in Pennsylvania. Audubon Park in Kentucky. But then we see something, and this happens right around the time that Pelham Wood and Pelham is being developed. I still haven't solved this mystery. It shouldn't be a hard mystery to solve. It's one that we'll solve at some point. I just haven't been able to do it yet. But he begins to shift his focus away from Wood, Harmon, and Co. to a new venture that he's created. You'll see in this 1909 real estate reference from the New York Times, there's a reference to, quote, a new real estate firm has been formed to be known as Clifford B. Harmon and Co. with main offices at Madison Avenue and 42nd Street. Now this new real estate venture happens to be the one that developed Pelham Wood. So Wood, Harmon and Co. is involved in development of Harmon and Clifford B. Harmon and Co. is involved in developing Pelham Wood and quite a number of other developments after Pelham Wood. In the upper right hand corner, there on the screen, you see a photograph of the Pelham Wood sales office. And what Carl made reference to earlier in terms of visiting Pelhamwood, you're looking at the sales office from the back side as we would think of it today, okay? Behind that sales office is this grand, reminding you much of what you see in Grand Central, this grand staircase, stone staircase, that extended from the sales office down a hill out to the train station in Pelhamwood. And of course, in Pelham Wood, while he's developing that, he's using some of the tricks that he developed here in Harmon. Most of you know the stories of some of the billboards that he had here in Harmon when he was trying to sell the lands. In Pelham Wood, he had the classic. Okay, it was scattered all over the place. Billboards. If you lived in Pelham Wood, you'd be home now. And that's what he had. And that's what you passed on the train as you passed right by that sales office there. But I want you to look at that sales office because I'm going to show it to you again in a second. I'm going to show you the same photo right there. And I'm going to show you that photograph right next to the sales office here in Harmon. Mm -hmm. Down below is a postcard view of Larchmont Gardens, actually Lake Larchmont, an older view of the old Lake Larchmont there in Larchmont Gardens. Again, part of what he tried to do. He tried to develop areas that he considered that would be considered by the prospective purchasers as gorgeous, beautiful enclaves that would be somewhat, somewhat the kind of place that people would want to live, that people would want to bring up their children in, that people would want to see differences in the architectural schemes, architectural schemes that in effect would kind of match the landscape as well, part of his signature, so to speak, in terms of developing lots with the lay of the land. Now, if you look down there in the lower right-hand corner, there's the what we call the tea house. Okay, there in Pelham, that was his sales office. You've got a little bit more of a distant photograph up there of the sales office in Harmon. But if you really start to blow these up electronically and start to look at them, they are extraordinarily similar. They're extraordinarily similar. There are clearly differences in them, but the way they've set this up, it's clear to me that they had pretty much a, let's get this sales office up fast. It's going to be the thing that we're bringing our prospective buyers to at the time. And you start to see this sort of thing in a number of the communities that he was developing at about the time. Now, you'll see you've got a quote now from a 1907 New York Times article about Harmon. And it says, during the last year, great changes have taken place at Harmon. Wood, Harmon, and Co. bought the old Van Cortland estate property just before it had been decided to locate the electric terminal at Harmon. And it is the intention of Clifford B. Harmon, under whose directions the plans and improvements are being made, to create an entirely new city, which will be restricted throughout. The property will be divided into four sections, business, residence, villa, and bungalow. 